welcome D-Challenge teams and um, uh, in the DKNet team as well. We are very excited to do a deep dive into the AIR community's eye receptor and adaptive um, immune receptor repertoire uh, tools and resources. They have a very interesting uh, background with the, I think they'll each give you, a, Brian, Corey, and Kira Neller are gonna be presenting and they'll give you a little background about what these uh, resources are. They're affiliated with Simon Fraser University, SFU up in Western Canada. And what they've got today is, um, you know, a really nice presentation about, you know, talking to us about what, um, you know, what their tools are, what their resources are, and how you might access and use them. So uh, take it away. We'll have Brian speaking first. Actually, Felix is going to start first. Felix is oh, sorry, <laughs> Felix. Yeah, yes. so I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't even mention no you. Problem. I wasn't sure. Yeah. Felix Braden coming as well from yeah. SFU, mm -hmm. one of the, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, founders of the air community and uh, yes tell us a little bit about what it what it is and how old it is and and in how you started it yeah well great thanks monica and thanks for the yeah the opportunity to talk about eye receptor and the adaptive immune receptor repertoire community we've been working on it gosh the community for almost 10 years and eye receptor for about eight years um we'll talk about you know the adaptive immune receptor repertoires. By that, we mean B cell antibody repertoires and T cell repertoires and all of the, um, what we've done over the last years. But really one of the messages is you have these huge repertoires um, that are able to uh, monitor the adaptive immune system in great detail. And so they're so diverse that they, actually they have the history of the immune system and they can be used to predict the response of the immune system, such as you know, the response to a vaccine or the response to a new um, uh, cancer immunotherapy. So, so part of what we really wanna impress with is that there's so much data there and it really is a good place to look for the types of questions that I think the D challenge is, uh, is looking for. So, to do this, um, I'm going to first talk about just the air community and the adaptive immune system. You have to learn a little bit about the adaptive immune system to understand where all these data are coming from and you know, what they can predict. So the adaptive um, immune system, uh, it, for the air community, we focus on antibody B cell receptors and T cell receptors. We call that air seek data, adaptive immune receptor repertoire. Um, basically, any disease with an immune component, this is relevant to, so it's relevant to infectious diseases, to autoimmune diseases, of course, and then to, as I say, these novel cancer immunotherapies where you're trying to turn on the immune system to attack the cancers. Um, it's called the adaptive immune system because basically it evolves. Um, T cells and B cells, we'll mention, have this unique way of producing the huge diversity that is uh, necessary in the adaptive immune system especially with B cells and antibodies, um, basically when you have a clone that produces a receptor that is really good at recognizing a pathogen, that clone is told to, uh, to, um, to expand and to mutate. And then new subclones are selected. Those that are even better at binding are selected. And so those are then to, told to expand and mutate. So you have this evolutionary system within the body, which allows you to produce these a, a, a really tight binders to new pathogens. So it evolves within the systems, but it has to be incredibly variable to recognize all the known pathogens and even newly emerging pathogens, but then also to recognize the self um, proteins and not attack the self proteins. So an autoimmune disease is a disease where the adaptive immune system um, makes a mistake and starts attacking self proteins. So this, this system has to be hugely variable. And that's one of the reasons the air community started its work, maybe even 10 years ago, because these data are so diverse, and they're hard to um, curate, and they're unique. So I'm going to go through that a little bit, trying to explain a little bit more um, in, in how they're unique and how diverse they are. So next slide. Right, and this all comes down to really one of the main things is VDJ recombination. So how do you produce anywhere from 10 to the 13th possible uh, B cell receptors in the human um, uh, population? Well, you have these sets of variable 
diversity in joining genes, anytime you're going to start a new T cell receptor uh, cell or a new B cell receptor antibody cell, the body takes one V gene, one D gene, and one G gene and stitches it together. So these are this is the only type of system in the eukaryote genome that does this sort of recombination on the germline genes, on the chromosomes. And it's, it's actually shown by this little, um, uh, little scissors here. It actually snips out the DNA in between the genes and stitches one V, one D, and one J together. So you get already get a lot of combinatorial um, uh, um, uh, diversity. And then when you when the body puts those genes together, it adds or subtracts certain a small number of nucleotides. So that increases the diversity. So each um, new clone, this VDJ recombination and all the cells that are descended from this uh, cell, this clone has a unique signature. And, and this is the way we start producing this huge variability in the adaptive immune system. And again, with B cells, they're even more diverse because with B cells or antibodies, the, the cells that produce antibodies, then um, as the body is challenged with a new pathogen, those B cell receptors that bind well, again, the clones are told to expand and mutate, and then there's more selection, and then the ones that are good binders are told to expand and mutate. So this unique system produces this variability, this huge diversity of the adaptive immune system. So that's important how diverse it is. It's also unique in that because of this, you need, um, the community needs uh, unique bioinformatic tools that are able to follow these clones, that are able to take a new expressed uh, receptor and say, what were the original V, D, and J genes that it started with from the germline? and um, be able to compare these repertoires and stuff like that. So they're highly variable and they need unique ways of storing the data, comparing the data, the germline genes um, and, and analyzing how the clones are expanding and, and, and questions like that. Next slide, please. So we're basically talking about why the air community needed, you know, felt they needed to have a new initiative to curate and uh, analyze and share these data. So these AirSeq data are difficult to share and compare. This flow just shows you all the different ways, you know, you can take it from germline, you can take it from uh, 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 message RNA, you have different ways of sequencing the genes, you have different ways of, of having primers that, uh, um, um, that amplify the genes. You have different ways of once you have the sequences, putting the sequences together and having um, quality control, then annotating the genes against the germline, and then finally different ways of analyzing the genes. So all of these um, are slightly, are, are steps where the analysis from the molecular to the bioinformatic analysis can vary. So that's another reason why we felt we needed an initiative to try to have community standards for explaining how these data were, in each case, how the data were um, um, obtained. And then everybody can look at that and say, well, yeah, I do want to include these data into my study in comparison, or maybe I don't because I want to only use ones that are annotated from a certain way. So all these, all these um, considerations brought us to start this initiative called the Adaptive Immune Receptor Repertoire Community. And then Kira and um, Brian will talk about how this is, 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 is unfolded. But while we have a little understanding, and let, before we, I turn it over to Brian, I have a few slides just to say, well, what can you do with these data? And this is one of my favorite slides. It shows, um, this is in chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So this is a blood cancer. Um, and in blood cancers, one of the things that happens are these either B cells or T cells lose control and they completely overgrow all the other um, B cells that, that you, you have in your body. So on the right side is a healthy donor. These are all the B cells in, um, sequenced out of the uh, peripheral blood. And each of these gray blobs are sets of related um, sequences. So these are best guess at what the clones are. And on the healthy individual on the right side, 
you see a rather uniform distribution of B cell clones. And so there haven't been any that have overly expanded. <clears throat> On the left, you see a person with uh, CLL and you see that a few B cell clones have greatly overexpanded. So this picture gives you kind of a good picture of what a clone is. And it also shows you in a disease situation where um, these clones can be um, basically in this case, a blood cancer. Um, in the next slide, please. Um, since we're concentrated here on autoimmune disease, this is an early example of one of the things you can do with these um, uh, air seek data. In this case, we're looking at uh, multiple sclerosis. So we have an autoimmune disease. You have B cells that are attacking um, the glial cells in the central nervous system. But it's always a question like, what are they, what are the B cells? Um, you know, they have all these mutations. They've, they've become highly reactive with certain types of cells, but where did they come from? Where did they get their mutations that then allowed them to start attacking the glial cells and produce an autoimmune condition? And in this case, a person, um, particularly under, uh, from Steve Kleinstein's lab, they sequenced a bunch of clones at, from both the CNS and then from the draining lymph nodes. And so they use those mutations to put together a phylogeny, which we see on the right side. And this is a phylogeny of all the descendant cells from the original clone, the B cell clone. And then it's the gray versus the lighter gray is where that particular sequence was found, either in the draining lymph node or in the CNS. And so it shows a lot of crosstalk or movement between these compartments um, as the B cell evolves to be a tight binder to the glial cells. So it, it's, it's a bit of a primitive ex example, but this is what people have been doing more and more. They look at basically a biogeography of the B cell clones within the body. You know, where did it come from? When did it start uh, you know, getting the mutations that turned it into an autoimmune you know, producing cell? And this then gives you again, a, 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 real, um, a real exquisitely detailed history of the adaptive immune system from these huge data sets. Um, and that's where we are. So uh, the next slide, um, that's why the adaptive immune uh, receptor um, community decided, well, we need to start sharing these data and having these data under um, common metadata standards so that you can actually have different studies um, easily comparing the data among the different diseases and different labs and different institutions. So we're a grassroots group of immunologists, bioinformaticists, and computational scientists. We basically really just want to make it easy to share these data to increase sample sizes. Very importantly, um, like you were studying type 1 diabetes, but you might see some clones that are important to the type 1 diabetes. You want to see, do they occur in other autoimmune diseases, in healthy individuals, and um, things like that. Um, one couple more slides and I'll be done. Um, one of the guts of the adaptive immune, uh, of the air community are the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, are the working groups, um, common repository working groups, the germline database, legal and ethics standards. <clears throat> so these groups meet once a month. They're very active. Um, and then the final slide from my part <clears throat> is a lot of the standards that the AIR community has developed come out of these working groups. They produce a paper and then the entire community, which is open to the international community, um, votes on these papers. And so you don't produce a standard unless the whole community has agreed that this is a good standard and that it will move the field forward. And some of the examples here, the minimal standards were produced in Nature Immunology in 2017, Common Repository Group and Data Representation Group have, have produced um, papers with standards. All of these are ratified by the full air community. Everybody is invited, um, students, postdocs, um, up to, you know, Retired people <laughs> are invited to uh, join the air community and um, just contact us. Uh, the, the website is www.air-community.org. And we are always open to have people work with the working groups and um, help move the community ahead. It's a very open grassroots community. 
So with that, we're going to go, um, Brian and Kira are going to get into the more details of it, um, how to work with these data. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. That was really an excellent uh, overview of, of all that uh, your data commons and uh, iReceptor have uh, accomplished. It's amazing. So Very exciting. Thank yeah, you. it is. Thank you. Okay, Brian, uh, would you like to take, uh, take over? You bet. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about kind of the platform that we've developed through iReceptor. Um, but first, I need to talk about the Air Data Commons. So the Air Data Commons is basically a distributed set of repositories that store the type of data that Felix was talking about. Um, and because we have a set of standards, um, it's relatively easy to uh, query these distributed repositories and find data of interest. So that's kind of one of the really key aspects of the Air Data Commons as it's driven by these standards. Um, and because we have a distributed set of re repositories, so th these data sets are very large. Uh, you can have millions of sequences per sample, hundreds of samples per study, and there are hundreds or not thousands of studies that uh, capture this type of data. So these are really, really large data sets. Um, so a distributed data model allows for scalable repositories. We don't have to put all of this data in one place. Um, and that also allows for that data to be curated at a single home institutions under local data policies. So the data curators and data stewards have control over the data, which is important. But really one of the important things, and Felix kind of, uh, kind of mentioned that, so when, when you do a study of this type, you typically have you know, a small number of subjects. Um, and really what you need to do is compare the data that you gather with data that other people have found. Um, you might need to look at, if you're studying type 1 diabetes, you might need to look at other type 1 diabetes data. You might want to look at other autoimmune data sets. You might want to look at healthy controls. And you typically won't have all of those data sets, but that data exists out there because somebody else has done that research already. So really the goal here is to find data of interest. Um, we call that after you find it, you want to federate it, you want to bring it together. So it has to be accessible and it has to be interoperable. And if you have all of those components, so if the data is truly fair, you can reuse that data. And that data reuse uh, really derives, helps you derive new insights um, from, from your data and your research. So iReceptor basically, one way of thinking of it is it implements all of the AIR standards. So it consists of a couple of components, the iReceptor Scientific Gateway, and we have a software stack that allows you to uh, download and install and run a repository of your own. So the iReceptor Scientific Gateway is basically an interactive web-based portal. You sit in your web browser and type queries and commands. Um, and what it queries is the AIR Data Commons. So the, the AIR Data Commons is this di distributed set of data repositories around the world. And they are all standards compliant. And that is really, really key because we can't do this without the standards. So basically what the gateway does is it sends out a query to the Air Data Commons. And really what that's doing is that's querying a bunch of databases around the world and bringing back results uh, about the data that you're interested in. So really what the iReceptor gateway is all about is hiding the complexity from the user of all of these complex queries that are going out to all these repositories all the time. Kira is going to give you a bit of a, a deep dive into kind of the user interface and stuff. So I'm not going to talk about that too much right now. So the Air Data Commons has been existent for quite some time. Um, it started smallish um, with two repositories, uh, ours and a group at UTSW in the US called VDJ Server. But it's grown substantially over time. And currently there are over 5 billion annotated sequences from on the order of, I think, 5,000 repertoires from about 100 studies or something like that. Um, I'd have to look to get the details. Um, and the way that the repositories have grown and the data has grown is through small uh, step increases. I'm going to talk about COVID-19 uh, as a driver for data sharing and kind of relate that to type 1 diabetes in a way um, as, as to some of the potential. Um, but in, when COVID hit, we basically got a really, really large influx of data and a really, really large amount of interest from users. Uh, and from the, ex the most, one, maybe one of the most exciting things is over the last kind of year or so, we basically had a growth of the actual number of repositories. So we now have uh, seven, maybe eight, and probably in the next couple of months, nine or 10. So a couple more repositories coming online, including what um, some work we're doing with the type one diabetes community to get something up and running. So that's on the horizon. 
And again, just to kind of focus on kind of the, the COVID, uh, COVID influx. So, I mean, I think everybody knows uh, way too much about B cells and T cells because of COVID. Uh, I don't think B cells and T cells were probably common knowledge before COVID hit, but now everybody knows what a B cell and T cell is, at least at some level. Um, so in July and June, May, June of 2020, shortly after COVID hit, we saw the first data sets uh, become available. Um, and we saw a really large influx of users uh, at that point. Um, we have a very strong international user base. Our user base is uh, spread uh, all over the world. Um, and interestingly enough, we have a pretty strong um, industrial user base. So quite a few, 80% of the new users since June 2020 um, are from, have been from industry. This is just a quick uh, timeline of kind of the COVID um, kind of the COVID workflow. So Nielsen uh, et al, they published a paper on it with the first COVID-19 data set um, in probably April or May. Um, by June, we had that online. Um, several other studies came out shortly thereafter. One of the really things that drove uh, data sharing and data reuse was a paper by Schultes et al. And uh, one of the reasons that was really important is they reached out to us before they published their data, their paper. They, we curated their data in advance of their paper. This was a really, really compelling study. Um, it was the first uh, longitudinal study of COVID-19 data. So they basically had a time series data from 46 subjects out over 55 days um, with up to nine time points for a specific subject. So you could really uh, monitor the time course and the progression of disease across these patients. So this is really exciting. And they cited iReceptor as a platform for uh, where that data could be found. And that really, really drove um, papers. Um, so we got lots of papers. We're collaborating quite closely with these researchers to curate the data. And that process continued on and it continues on uh, to this day. More data, more data sets are being produced and curated all the time. Um, and so one of the things that that drove is not only, the, so those were all curation papers. Um, this set of papers, and I'm not going to dive into this in any detail whatsoever, but these are all papers that actually cite the iReceptor and the AirData, iReceptor and the AirData Commons as places where they found data for reuse, right? So these researchers are actually taking that data that those other researchers published and are reusing it um, or talking about it and discussing it in their papers. Um, so this is this is uh, about kind of data reuse and the compelling um, case for sharing data and, and providing valuable scientific insight because of that data sharing and data reuse. And so I guess one of the questions that we're working on, and we're kind of working with some of the type one diabetes um, collaborators through Monica and and uh, and some of her collaborators on kind of trying to essentially reproduce this this workflow and this model um, for type one diabetes. And I'll just talk really briefly about some of the exciting um, kind of next steps. So the bulk AirSeq data that, that Felix was talking about was really kind of uh, this deep sequencing. Um, one of the emerging technologies is, is single cell RNA, -seq, RNA sequencing. And that data type is basically, um, typically you get smaller data sets, but you get a much, much richer view of each of the cells in that data set. So you get paired chains. So you get the paired heavy and light chain, which Felix mentioned briefly. Um, you get much better clone resolution. And you get to know a little bit more about kind of the, the gene expression. So kind of the function of what each of those cells is doing um, and maybe where it is in its uh, transformation um, in that kind of phylogenetic tree process. Um, so single cell air seq data and, uh, and bulk air seq data are very compl complementary and they help you gain a better understanding of that immune cell phenotype and what the, fun what the function of that, uh, those cells are. Um, so typically in the world of the AirSeq data, typically what you get is something like this. So this is just kind of a, a, a B cell and a, a or sorry, a, a T cell, a, a, an alpha and a, and a beta chain. Um, and it's basically a clone that's highly expanded. When you get uh, gene expression data along that with that, so the single cell world, you get a much better idea of what that kind of function of that cell is and how it fits into the overall um, kind of immune system. So that's kind of where things are going. 
Um, so in iReceptor version 4.0, which we are about to release any time now, um, uh, you will soon be able to curate both AirSeq data and single cell gene expression data in the Air Data Commons. And the reason, again, that that's possible is that the Air community has developed a uh, single cell gene expression uh, standard that was released in August 2022. And we are implementing that, and we expect to be in production with a new version of our gateway, which Kira is going to talk about um, in 2020, late 2020, which hopefully will be by next month. Um, and so really what that means is kind of this is the world of iReceptor version 3, but we really are starting to expand the types of data that we can integrate. Um, and including uh, external repositories that we're able to query. And again, Kira will talk a little bit about this. And then we have this new analysis capability, which Kira is also going to mention. And so I will pass that over to Kira. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'll let Kira share her screen. You should be good to go, Kira. Oh, Monica, you're Great. muted. Yeah, sorry. Thank you very much, Brian. That was excellent. And I, I'm really looking forward to uh, what Kira is going to share next. Are we all set up here? You can see my screen now, I think. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Let me just. Uh... All right. So, as Brian said, I'm going to be. Uh, sort of diving further into the iReceptor gateway. Um, uh, so my part of the talk will be sort of going over the iReceptor platform and I've sort of integrated some of the T1D use cases to highlight the key features of the platform. And then I'll be um, presenting some of the really exciting things that we are looking forward to put into production for iReceptor uh, version 4.0 specifically relating to clones and cell data, clone and cell data, as well as some of the um, analyses capabilities. So you heard about the iReceptor gateway, but how does it work and what does it look like? So the iReceptor gateway, as you know, searches the Air Data Commons, which presently consists of uh, seven repositories, 84 studies, a bit higher than 5,000, which is the number that uh, Brian quoted. So uh, 8,919 repertoires and over 5 billion sequence annotations. And as these uh, pie charts here show uh, just a snapshot of the data in the Air Data Commons. So you have different study types, uh, observational study, case and control study. Uh, most of the data is from humans. There's a bit from mouse. Uh, there's 58 diagnoses, uh, no type 1 data, type 1 diabetes data uh, presently. However, we are working with the community to get that data in as soon as possible. Um, 30 tissues are represented. Most of that is blood. The um, immune receptor uh, loci, so you have TRA, B, IGH, K, and L, et cetera. And um, there are two different workflows for actually searching through this wealth of data. So you can look either by browsing the repertoire metadata, which I'm gonna discuss first, or you can use this handy dandy kind of sequence quick search feature where you simply um, type in a CDR3 amino acid sequence <clears throat> and you can search uh, through the gateway um, all, all the uh, sequences in the Air Data Commons. So first looking at the repertoire metadata search, um, this is just uh, the default view when you first look to browse the metadata. So you can, so this is, this view is showing all the um, 8,900 repertoires, but you can filter that down by applying different filters at the study subject or sample level. Um, this is a default sort of display for viewing the uh, different fields, but you can customize the display. Um, as shown here, this is a snapshot of, again, those uh, 80 study subject and sample air standard metadata fields. Um, so you can see the sort of main heading and then the different uh, fields within those different categories. One thing I want to call attention to that's interesting uh, probably to this, uh, the members of the D challenge is that we have this new feature available uh, in the newly released uh, AIR standards is the ability to 
uh, store the MHC genotype. So this is, of course, relevant to uh, PCR analysis. Now, presently, we don't have any uh, data in the Air Data Commons that is making use of this schema. But again, we'll be working with the T1D community to actually curate this data and have it uh, have it accessible soon. So that's really exciting. here. Just a quick note yeah. on that: we do have some coming in from the T1D community, and how quickly might that be available to sort of like first look to the G Challenge teams? Um, we're hoping within uh, the next couple of weeks. Okay, that could work. All right. Um, so although we don't have uh, type 1 diabetes data available presently, I certainly do want to point out that um, we do have a bunch of healthy control data, and I think this could be quite valuable to the uh, D challenge folks. So in this view, what I've done is I've uh, filtered down all the repertoire metadata to highlight um, the study group is uh, co healthy controls. So what this is showing is that there's uh, almost 260 million sequences from 222 repertoires across 12 studies. So a fair amount of data. And we also have these sort of interactive repertoire st statistics that you can, uh, if you click on any button for any of the uh, repertoires there, it opens up this panel where you can get um, different high value sort of summary statistics on a repertoire basis. So here we have uh, V gene, D gene, J gene, and junction length uh, distributions. So junction length uh, the amino acids uh, dis length distribution. What I'm showing here is the V gene uh, subgroup family level. But as I said, this is interactive. So you can, for example, if we see here that uh, the TRBV5 is the most heavily used uh, family in this uh, repertoire, you can click on that and drill down. And then you can get the gene level distribution for the TRBV5 uh, family. And you can go further down into the allele level, which I'm uh, not showing here, but feel free to explore. So back to our healthy controlled data. Um, this is the repertoire view, but once you have sort of narrowed down your, um, uh, your data of interest, you can then click on the browse sequence button and you can browse sequences from all these 222 repertoires. So when you get into the second phase of the uh, search, this is the sequence search. We have displayed here the V gene, D gene, J gene uh, calls, the CDR3 amino acid sequence and the um, or junction and the junction length. Um, and again, you can filter down this data in terms of any specific V, D, J uh, gene you're interested in and the junction AA length. And then when you're ready, you can download this data and uh, explore it for, or use it to uh, offline to do any sort of exploratory analyses. So that was the uh, sort of browsing the repertoire metadata. And um, moving on, I want to introduce the second feature I mentioned, which was the sequence quick search. And for that, I wanted to um, illustrate this feature using sort of some uh, T1D examples from the literature. So this is a paper I, fa I found from uh, Fuchs et al. 2017. The title is CD8 T cells specific for the islet autoantigen IGRP are restricted in their T cell receptor chain usage. So what I've done here is I've just highlighted a relevant part of the abstract here where they point out that a specific motif corresponding to TRAJ53 was enriched in these T1D patient-derived clonotypes. So this is an excellent example to showcase the sequence quick search. All I did was I took that uh, motif, I popped it into the field there, hit search, and I'm showing the results of that search. So what you're seeing is that there are uh, 2.7 million sequences. So this motif was found 2.7 million sequences uh, across uh, 3,555 repertoires in the Air Data Commons. Uh, six studies uh, have found this motif. 
And um, again, this is just showing a fraction of the sequences, but you see that TRA, TRAJ53. Uh, we can say that it's definitely a public motif. It's present in 55 subjects. Uh, again, you see, as we expect, the, the data all pretty much all comes from TRA, the TRA locus. And it's also found in um, subjects with different diagnoses. Um, if you look actually at the other diagnosis, um, which represents 20% of that data, the majority of that other data is actually um, from diagnosis is none. So that means that these are healthy individuals. Um, so this, as a, to me, as a non-expert in the field, was sort of um, interesting. Uh, as I sort of put in the title there, um, it was curious to me that these islet-specific TCRs are present in non-T1D individuals. So I went uh, to do some further digging in the literature, and I found that this does, in fact, agree with previous findings. So here I'm showing um, a recent review from uh, Nakayama and Michaels using the T-cell receptor as a biomarker in type 1 diabetes. And I highlighted some relevant features uh, where they say that uh, it's controversial whether T1D patients have distinct islet antigen-specific T-cell subsets in the blood compared to healthy individuals. And in fact, a number of studies indicate that uh, healthy individuals do have these islet antigen-specific T cells. So um, it's pretty remarkable that, you know, in this example, without having any T1D data uh, in the Air Data Commons, we've already been able to back up some of these um, some of these findings that are known in the literature. I think that's pretty cool. Um, to illustrate the second sort of newly introduced feature. Uh, in the gateway, which pertains to antigen specificity. Um, I want to again use a, I'm going back to this uh, review, and there was another sort of feature that stuck out to me, um, which was the uh, reference to these non diabetic nod mice, which develop insulin and autoantibodies. And uh, they, uh, in this review, they state that they're Many researchers have found uh, CD4 T cells um, in these NOD uh, mice that actually are reactive to insulin B chain peptides. So for this, I want to illustrate our um, IEDB integration where we're linking out to IEDB to sort of showcase uh, some interesting findings <clears throat> that this little feature was able to um, uncover. So, the sort of case study here is identifying insulin binding TCRs. So for that, I first went to IEDB. I wanted to identify what um, insulin binding TCRs have been uh, noted uh, in this database. So I applied some filters. I have a filter for the antigen, which is insulin, and the disease data uh, restriction is type 1 diabetes. So looking on the receptors tab, you can see that uh, IEDB has documented 206 of these insulin binding TCRs associated with T1D. So if we just take uh, the top one there, the chain one CDR3 that I've highlighted, um, we can again uh, pop that into the sequence quick search from the I receptor gateway. And same sort of thing as before, we use the se uh, sequence quick search to um, search the, the Air Data Commons, but what's sort of going on behind the scenes, which I didn't mention previously, <clears throat> is that the gateway do, does a simultaneous query to IEDB for known binding interactions. And if it finds any, then it reports them, as you can see in that uh, blue box that uh, popped up on the side there. So um, I'll get to that in a sec, but what I want to say is that in this example, uh, the gateway was able to find 258 sequences with this uh, insulin uh, responsive CDR3 in the Air Data Commons. 75% um, of these sequences uh, come from, again, those healthy individuals. And what was interesting to me was the fact that you have um, these bacterial species sort of popping up in terms of uh, um, some known specificity. 
So we have, you see uh, there's a known specificity to humans as we would expect. Um, but then, you know, what are all these, what's this bacterial stuff about? Um, I'm not sure, but one hypothesis could be that these are perhaps cross-reactive uh, T cells that arose from a previous infection. So again, I'm not an expert. I don't, I'm not sure, you know, if that's a, a sort of valid hypo hypothesis, but to me as a non-expert, these are just some some interesting things again that pop up. Um, so yeah, Kira, I would just uh, note that that is a, a very interesting uh, hypothesis that you identified or you know, are raising because one of the teams um, coming from the Altidus lab in Boston is very interested in, in that area and oh, cool. um, have published on it already. So it's uh, wonderful, fantastic, uh, very good, excellent. So well. I guess I don't have to sort of prove anything to you then in that case that this is maybe not that uh, uncommon, but I wanted to sort of do a reverse search to show that this was uh, in fact able to be reproduced at IEDB. It wasn't a sort of weird bug in the gateway. So what I did was I went back to IEDB. I uh, searched for that same uh, receptor chain sequence. And as you see, insulin uh, as the antigen pops up, and again, uh, you do in fact see these bacterial uh, species. So one is an, an uncharacterized protein and one is an NADPH dependent butanol dehydrogenase, if that means anything to anybody, uh, hopefully it does. Uh, not to me though, but um, yeah, that was sort of, again, the second sort of uh, use case I wanted to show with our, we're really moving towards linking out to interesting databases and uh, some cool hypotheses that are coming from that. Kara, can I get just to go back two slides? I just wanted to point out one thing too. Yep. Um, so if you look at this, that 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 found 258 sequences out of 5 billion. So that is truly a needle in the haystack search that really isn't possible unless you have 5 billion sequences, right? If you have a billion, you might not find that CDR3 and may not come up with that hypothesis at all. Um, so I think that I think that's also pretty intriguing, right? Because that's found 258 sequences across 54 repertoires and 22 subjects, right? So there's a, a tiny number of sequences, you know, like 10 sequences in 22 subjects to get to 250, yeah. right? So that's that's a that's a really interesting kind of dynamic that you just don't get unless you have the scale yeah. of data that's in the Air Data Commons. That's Sorry. right, I, and it really shows, it demonstrates the power of um, what we're talking about here, these tools and uh, resources. And how quickly were you able to do that search? I mean, they're pretty fast too. Oh, I mean, in under a minute. Yeah. I can't wait to unleash these teams on, uh, on the yeah. receptor. <laughs> All right. Th thanks, Brian. That's an excellent point. Um, let's see. Get back. All right. So in the final uh, sort of portion of my presentation, I want to be more uh, forward or future looking and highlight uh, some of the cool features that we're really excited to put in production for iReceptor version 4.0. Uh, relating to clone cell and analysis capabilities. So uh, we've been working really hard to introduce new workflows for finding clone and cell data that has been uh, curated according to the newly uh, updated uh, AIR standards. So as you can see here, so what I'm showing here in these next uh, slides are screenshots from the, from the uh, new version of the gateway that's soon to be released. So what you can see here is, um, whereas before we only had sequence search results, now we have a tab or different tabs that show um, sequences, clones, and cell data that is available. So this is just for a single study. It's sort of our uh, testing sort of example study, but uh, we're really excited to be able to add new data for um, these data types uh, soon. So let's sort of look at the UI for browsing this new data. So in terms of clones, you see um, the uh, sort of same 
uh, level of data that you, or same fields that you saw at the uh, sequence rearrangement level. So you see the V call, D call, J call, junction AA. Um, in addition, now you have the clone ID. So this was uh, whatever the data was annotated with uh, by the researcher. Their uh, clone ID that, that was populated, it's, uh, we're displaying that here. So if there's any particular clone from a, you know, a paper or something that you wish to look up, you can uh, use that uh, ID. We also have the clone count for that clone. So how many members are within that clone? And then the sequence count. So what's the total abundance of that clone? Um, and like before that you saw with the sequence level, you can also filter the, this clone data by V, D, and J gene and junction AA length. What about cells? So for cells, uh, this is the proposed UI. So we have in this, uh, in this uh, table here, each row is one cell. Uh, so you have the cell barcode there. And because with the uh, technology of single cell sequencing or single cell immune profiling, you can um, associate those two chains. We have provided for uh, visualization of that uh, through the interface. So for each cell, we have um, associated the chain one and the chain two, as I'm showing here, and we are displaying the V gene and the CDR3. As well, we're showing for each cell the top four highly expressed genes. So this is just a, a quick way to get a sense of you know, what, the cell, uh, what the cell phenotype is, what the cell activity might be. Um, but in order to um, see all of the uh, gene expression of each, each cell, you can download, uh, download the data. And we also have filters for uh, filtering on different properties. Uh, you can filter by, um, again, different sort of cell uh, features and cell expression. So if you are interested in a certain gene, then you can um, filter based off the cell expression to uh, restrict the list to only cells that are uh, highly, express, highly expressing that gene. So as uh, Brian mentioned for iReceptor, the current version of iReceptor version 3.0 was all about uh, selecting your data of interest and downloading it. And in version 4.0, we're, we're really excited to introduce the ability to run analysis uh, right on the, in the gateway. So we have these analysis apps. I'm just showing a couple here. These are for some of the single cell type of data. Um, where a user can then run the analysis on the data directly. So the user and the data never actually have to leave the platform. So a little bit more about what this looks like. Um, so this is a cell typist job that I'm, I've ran. And so cell, cell typist, it's a single cell annotation tool. So it annotates individual cells based off of their gene expression profile. So with just a couple of job control parameters, a user can submit a cell type this job and the gateway essentially does all the heavy lifting. So it does, it downloads the data that the user has selected from the Air Data Commons. It stages it to computation. It sets up the app, stages it to computation. It runs a job, tabulates the results and presents the results to the user. Um, and in terms of presenting the results, here's sort of the UI for that. So in this case, for the cell typist job, we actually ran it on five uh, independent uh, repertoires. And we have an analysis summary tab, which allows you to capture just, <clears throat> or allows you to view sort of the key summary uh, figures. And then there's another tab I'm not showing, but it's a detailed view where you can uh, see literally everything that the tool produced. But if you just click on one of those uh, view summary buttons, you can see the um, key output, which in this case for cell typist uh, what is the, the UMAP sort of visualized visualization of the cell classification. So not going to get into that, but that's uh, basically what you can expect. And we have apps for uh, sequences and clone level data as well. So some of the example output, uh, you'll be able to uh, visualize VJ gene usage heat maps, junction AA length distributions uh, with ImmuneArch, which is an app that we uh, integrated 
um, it's a community tool and we integrated it into the gateway. Uh, you can look at the top clones and different uh, ways of visualizing uh, clonal abundance. And for cells, as I already mentioned, some um, example I'll put here is we have uh, introduced another community tool called Conga, which is interesting because it uh, clusters cells based off of their gene expression as well as their TCR sequence feature. So anybody doing TCR analysis, that, uh, that could be uh, hugely useful there. And then you already saw the cell typist uh, output. So um, I'm going to wrap it up for, or I'm going to ask, uh, I think, Brian or Felix to hop on and just do a bit of a wrap up. Great, that Thanks, was excellent, Kira. Kira. Thank you so much. Thanks. Can you can you just go to the next slide, Kara? Just yeah. So I mean, I, th I think kind of our goals with iReceptor has always been to kind of create a platform that kind of achieves this network effect. Um, having more repositories, more data allows you to do more things, and making that data fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable is really really important. Um, and I think just for this community and kind of what we're trying to do with Monica and the other T1D folks that we're talking with right now is kind of that that COVID-19 model for us was uh, really, really compelling uh, about the how data is shared and data is reused. Um, and so kind of extending that sharing culture to other diseases, um, in particular T1D in this context, I think is really, really important. Um, and so we're trying to get that critical mass from a T1D perspective going. Um, and then kind of the other part, I think, is just kind of what Kira was showing with that IEDB integration. Um, so AirSeq data and single cell analysis doesn't stand by itself. It's really about bringing all sorts of multi-omics uh, systems immunology data together. And so we're, you know, originally iReceptor was a, an interface to the Air Data Commons, whereas now we're really thinking of it more as an interface to solving immunology problems and integrating different types of data together uh, beyond what's just in the Air Data Commons. So that's kind of our future, I guess. So, and if you're interested, support at iReceptor.org. And Felix, did you want to add anything? Oh, just that, uh, you know, people really want it. A lot of times people want to share data, but it really takes a lot of organization. And thanks to Monica to just, you just got to keep <laughs> pushing, pushing, pushing to get these things together. But it, it looks like we're really moving forward with the type one diabetes work. Yeah, that's great. I, I would um, just ask a quick question regarding the HPAP data. Is that available to these teams? Still in, still in progress. Hmm. Okay. From, our, um, from, our, from, from the RC, Air Data Commons and iReceptor platform perspective, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so if anybody does want an account, just send it uh, on the iReceptor gateway, send an email to support at iReceptor.org. Mm -hmm. um, that's on the previous slide, Kira, if you want to back up one. Okay. Um, and we'll get you an account set up. Um, Thanks to the AIR team. Um, oh. You know, Felix, uh, Brian, and Kira for taking the time to share all this information with us. And um, to the D Challenge teams, uh, enjoy your weekend. Get some, get some deep dives in here, and um, we'll see you again next week. Thanks again right. to everyone who attended. Bye-bye.